Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Mangle, and I'm here with my colleague Ambika Biggs at Palero Maza. And we are thrilled to have you join us today for a webinar that we're calling Three Ways to Resolve Your Business Dispute. And uh, of course, there are many ways to resolve your business dispute, but we decided to leave out arm wrestling and dueling and some of the other ones that we didn't think were appropriate. I, I need to give you some background information, some general information. So before we get started, just know that today's slides you can download from the handouts tab on your GoToWebinar dashboard. That's your GoToWebinar dashboard. You can download the slides. And we're going to send you a copy of the slides and a link to the entire recorded session within a, a day or so of this particular session. And we are already having a technical difficulty, which is unfortunate. Uh, we, are, we can't seem to be changing the slides right now on the screen. And uh, our technical assistant is coming in to, us, to assist us. And, and hopefully, she will not be relying on me to, to do anything technical, because that would be a disaster. <laughs> it should be good now. OK, so this is a disclaimer. One, I've already given my technical expertise disclaimer. <laughs> This is my, uh, this is a disclaimer that indicates that we're attorneys, as you know, and we need to let you know that this session is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. Again, uh, as you can see from that slide, th these are your presenters. Um, my name is Paul Mangle. I'm counsel here, which counsel mainly means old, and uh, I'm an attorney who's spent my more than 25-year career primarily in the area of civil litigation and alternative dispute resolution, meaning uh, I, I'm not a sort of a, I, 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 I try cases, I try to resolve disputes both through litigation, through arbitration and mediation. I'm admitted in the United States Supreme Court. I'm admitted in all the state and federal and appellate courts in Washington, Maryland, and Virginia and I have practiced extensively in all those courts and I'm also admitted in various other courts around the country because we have litigated cases and by, as you all know and m many of you may be located in various parts of the country by virtue of this firm being uh, focused on government contracts and and legal matters that arise therefrom we certainly have conflicts that arise all over the country so I've tried cases in in multiple jurisdictions and I'll let my colleague Ambika introduce herself hi I'm Ambika Biggs I'm an associate with the firm I also practice in the litigation group, and like Paul, I also am admitted in uh, Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. courts. Um, I practice in both federal and state courts, and I also have experience in alternative dispute resolution matters, um, in addition to actually litigating in the courts. Uh, in addition to the litigation practice group, I also am a part of the government contracts group. Um, so I have experience with uh, those sort of matters, small business administration matters, um, and GAO protest. Thanks. And I, yeah, I should probably mention as well that I'm also in the labor and employment group because a lot of the litigation that we are involved in is labor and employment, but I head the litigation group. That's my primary responsibility. Um, for those of you that know about our firm, this may be redundant, but for those that you, you that don't, take a minute to please read about us. As I indicated, we're a firm that's primarily known as a government contracts firm, contracting firm, and for over 25 years we've handled business matters for our clients with complex um, business matters for our clients with the federal government. But we have, of course, obviously a litigation branch and a corporate department, labor and employment department, SBA procurement programs, and, and uh, pretty much that's what we mean by full service. We don't do, generally speaking, things like wills and trusts and domestic relations, but other than that, we have criminal work, but we cover the, the corporate and business world and the government contracts world. Um, you'll note that also on that slide that we offer uh, a wealth of uh, information to our clients and friends, including the Palermo Maza Legal Minute, the Legal Advisor newsletter, we have weekly updates, these webinars that are available on YouTube, and blogs on, on various subject uh, areas that we believe are interesting to our and helpful to our clients. So the reason we're here today 
uh, as you know, uh, or we're going to be talking about how to resolve business disputes. And this is a big subject, and we're not going to be able to cover it in great detail in the time allotted because any one of these subject areas we could spend days on. But what, what, what my goal is, um, is to simply give you an overview of the various mechanisms for resolving a business dispute and to give you, hopefully you'll come away with some insight on what you might think would be most helpful to your particular organization. And you might be mindful of these various alternatives the next time you are drafting a contract or a subcontract. Uh, because I, we have found, in my experience, that, that sometimes a client will come in that has been sued or someone has breached a contract or someone is about to uh, leave the firm and, or with the uh, secret sauce of the company and they really don't, aren't even aware of what, how the dispute will be resolved. They've got a provision, they've got a conflicts resolution provision in their contract that when it was drafted they really didn't pay much attention to, they took it as boilerplate or they accepted it and they, and they come to us and say, okay, well, we've got to do mediation then litigation. What does this mean? Or we've got to do arbitration. I've never done that. And so we want to give you some of the pros and cons of all these different conflict resolution provisions and let you know what you can expect if you already have these provisions in your contracts and are going forward. Um, we're going to talk about traditional litigation. We're going to talk about arbitration. And we're going to talk about mediation. And arbitration and mediation are sometimes just lumped into something called ADR. If you ever hear about ADR, and all that is is alternative dispute resolution, and the alternative means an alternative to going to court, which a lot of folks um, would probably prefer not to do. Um, and we're going to discuss the pros and cons of litigation versus ADR, uh, and determining whether your dispute is right for ADR. For example, um, in, in making that determination, you may have, for just by way of example, let's say that you learn that a subdivision of your company or some of your employees are about to leave, they have, they have started their own firm, or they have signed a contract with someone else, you have reason to believe that they have your proprietary information on their computers, or they have your subcontract templates, or they have other intellectual property, uh, your secret sauce, and they're about to go out the door. Well, obviously in a case like that, mediation, which is, is a voluntary process, where someone gets you in the room together and tries to reach an agreement is not going to be a viable solution. You need someone to basically put together a litigation strike force and go into court and file for an injunction and to stop these folks. So it will be self-evident in some conflicts that come up that, that, that some of these alternatives are not viable, but as you'll hear from Andy later, you can get injunctive relief if you are arbitrating. So. Um, that's what we mean by you need to determine whether your dispute is right for ADR. If your case is simply about money damages, and I understand that money damages is never simple nor is it insignificant, but if it's simply, I think they owe us money based on the performance of this contract or they breached and we want money, then any of these methods could be a possible um, resolution of your conflict. Um, so the first subject that I'd like to try to tackle is traditional litigation. And uh, if you don't know who I am and you're a client of this firm, then it, it's probably good for you because you probably haven't been involved in litigation. And if you don't know about litigation, you know, I lucky you, but I'd like to give you um, a, a summary of, because it's surprising the amount of our clients have not been involved in litigation. Um, and so basically litigation, and all, all litigation and arbitration involve parties that are in a dispute that are going to have a third party, an objective party, resolve that dispute finally once and for all. Um, and so the way in the old days, in, in the very old days, there, was, there were two different forms of litigation. There was the law side of the court and the equity side of the court. And that goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, back to the days when you you had a, a chancellor in equity and you had traditional judges that would decide legal matters like contracts and the equitable judges were people that decided more fair things. How do we split the baby? If someone's diverting my river upstream, how do I get my water? These sort of Solomon-esque decisions were decided by chancellors and that was they would try to do what's called equity or what is fair. And 
equitable relief is when you don't have a contract or you don't have a law that someone's breaking, but that there is some sort of wrong that needs to be righted where the third party has to decide not what the cases say is right or wrong, but what would be fair as to the outcome of the parties. And equitable relief is also extraordinary relief, such as injunctions. The baby is in the burning building. I need to kick the door down and save the baby. We don't have time to, to litigate this case. Injunctive relief, emergency relief, those are all equitable remedies where the court tries to do balance the equities of the parties and decide who should prevail and do what's fair, including emergency relief. But in the litigation, the first process is you file what's known as a complaint. And the complaint is, in federal rules, the complaint is required to be a short and plain statement of the facts and the relief that the party is seeking. You don't have to write war and peace, but you also have to go into enough detail to where the other side is basically sufficiently apprised of what the issues are, and they can read that complaint and viably defend themselves by filing an answer. So the complaint is usually has the same format. It's ABC Corp versus XYZ Corp. You select your jurisdiction. Uh, the complaint where the complaint is filed is driven by, it could be driven by a form, forum selection clause in your contract. Your contract might say the parties agree that any dispute will be litigated in the state courts of Maryland, or it may say Montgomery County, or it may say the federal courts of Virginia. If there is a form, forum selection clause in your contract, courts routinely enforce those. So if it says we're going to litigate this in Kalamazoo, uh, you may have to litigate it in Kalamazoo even though you, you're not even located in Kalamazoo. So you need to look at the forum selection clause. If there's not a forum selection clause, then where the case is litigated will be determined by perhaps there's a number of factors. Where the contract was entered into, where the contract was to be performed. There are various analyses that your attorney will do to make a determination if it's not specified in the contract where the case will be brought. Once you figure out where the case will be, and, 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 and if there are options, I should say, you may want to do what's frowned upon, but quite frankly is done all the time. It's called forum shopping. You may, you may know that a certain circuit court in Virginia is unfriendly generally towards a certain type of defendant or a certain type of plaintiff. Or you may, some of these smaller jurisdictions in Virginia, I mean, this is not the case in Northern Virginia or in the Maryland or the metro area, but if you've got a case that's going to be litigated in, let's say, Culpeper County, or, you know, in Southside, Virginia, there may just be one judge in that court. And, and it may be very easy to find out from the local attorneys how that judge feels about certain things. So you may not want to be in front of that judge, or you may want to be in front of that judge. So that factors into the decision sometimes if it's not just determined by the documents. But you file a complaint, it lays out the factual background, and it lays out what, breaking down, broken down into counts, what your relief you seek. In other words, you lay the factual predicate for what the you contend entitles you to the relief, and then you may have count one, breach of contract, and you lay out the, the terms of what, what you believe to be the breach. You may have a tortious interference with contract. Um, you may have a, a, a trade secret act count, but all of the counts would go into one complaint. You may have six causes of action against this, this company or this individual, but they would all go into one complaint, and then you would ask at the end for the relief that you're seeking. You would then go through the process, then the defendant would file an answer, or the defendant could file a motion to dismiss. Now, motions to dismiss, generally speaking, are, are granted more in federal court than in state court. State courts are reluctant to grant motions to dismiss because a lot of state court judges are afraid they're going to get reversed on appeal. Certainly in Virginia, that's the case. But if the complaint does not state on its face a cause of action, then you could bring a, a motion to dismiss and say the complaint ought to be dismissed because even if everything they say is true, they can't win. But at the motion to dismiss process, you should know that everything that they are saying is determined to be true. In other words, you can't file a motion to dismiss and say, well, that's not how it happened. How it really happened was X. A motion to dismiss is before any discovery and before anything is, has been adjudicated, and you're just simply saying, sure, okay, everything he says is true, but he still doesn't win. Then you get a motion to dismiss. If you can't bring a motion to dismiss, you have to answer the complaint. And that may say, denied, denied, admitted, admitted in part. I don't know whether that's true or not, but you either have to deny the allegations 
admit the allegations, or say you don't have sufficient information to respond to the allegations. Those are the three options. And obviously, you want to not be in a situation where if you're on the receiving end of a lawsuit that you admit so many things that you lose by admitting. So you have to be very careful when you draft your response. After the parties have filed their complaint and their answer or motion, then it, you are at what's called at issue. It means the case can go forward. And you're going, to get a, you're going to get a scheduling order from the court that's going to say, okay, this is how this is going to go. Discovery is going to go from, let's say you filed your case on January 1st. Discovery will go from January to April. Uh, we will then have dispositive motions or motions between April and, and, and June. And, and then discovery will be cut off in June. And you can bring summary judgment in July. And then the trial will be in August. But there will be a scheduling order that will lay out how these steps are going to occur. And judges generally certainly in federal court, are reluctant to change those dates. So you want to make sure that your attorney gives you plenty of time to litigate these issues, especially in sophisticated cases such as patent cases, intellectual property cases, trade secret cases. Those are complicated matters and you need a lot of time to litigate them. So what happens then is the discovery process. What do we mean by discovery? In, in the way cases are litigated in the United States of America, we have, a, a, it's basically open file. You, we do not do trial by ambush in this country. If you have sued me, I am entitled to know every single fact and every single piece of data that you're going to try to bring against me in this courtroom, I'm entitled to know. And it's like a poker game where you get to see the other party's hand. And, and so the discovery process is exactly what it sounds like. I get to discover every single thing that you say that I did wrong. I get to discover how you're going to defend this case, what you're going to say when you go to court. I get to know what your witnesses are going to say. We do not do trial by ambush, and the reason we don't is because if you couldn't ask these questions that you need to ask until the day of trial, every trial would last two months. So, so the process is depositions where you take witnesses into a room with a court reporter and you ask questions of that witness. Obviously, the questions have to be designed to lead to information that is, dis that is discoverable and relevant. You can't just go in there and harangue a witness. You have to, your questions have to be focused on the subject matter of the litigation, but there's a pretty broad net in discovery. It doesn't have to be admissible evidence, but it just has to be reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. So you have the depositions where you sit in the room with witnesses and transcribe their testimony under oath. You have written discovery, which are comprised of document requests. Basically, show me every document you're going to rely on in your case. Show me every document that you think is going to cause me harm. Show me every document that you intend to introduce at trial. You have interrogatories where those are questions that the party has to answer under oath. You contend that I breached your contract. Provide every single fact that you're going to rely on at trial that says that I breached your contract. Or you contend that if you contend that you did not um, do X, then provide all facts that support that contention. They have to answer those questions under oath and those questions can be used against them in their deposition and at trial. If you have an interrogatory answer where a person says that I mean, it, the light was green, and at the time of trial, they say the light was red. You're going to pull out their, their interrogatory or their deposition and say, but Mr. Jones, when I took, you remember when I took your deposition and you said X? And so interrogatories and depositions can be very effective tools in narrowing what someone's testimony can be. And you have requests for admissions. Admit that on X day you signed this contract. Admit that on Y day you went and talked to so-and-so about this contract. Admit on, on X day. So admissions are have to be answered by the parties. And after all of that process, you may have enough information to where you could bring a motion for summary judgment saying, look, judge, I took his deposition. Look at what he said. I win. Or look at these interrogatory answers. Based upon the application of the law to these answers, I win. If you don't have a dispositive motion, that's what's called a dispositive motion because it disposes of the case, you go to trial. And then you can either have a jury trial or a bench trial. Now, how do you make that decision? Personally, I think if you have a very sophisticated, complex legal issue or a complex technical issue, a construction case, a trade secret case, a patent case, you might not want that being decided by a jury. They go downstairs, they have lunch, they come back up, you're in the middle of some technical uh, presentation and you see them nodding I mean and, and, and or they don't like the looks of your client and your client doesn't present well on the stand they may have a foreman in there that says I don't care what the law is I'm not ruling in favor of that guy so you know you need to think about whether or, but on the other hand if you've been wronged and you're defending and you've got some guys on the other side and I use guys unisex by the way you've got parties on the other side that are disreputable or you think won't present well you might want a jury 
So that's a decision that you have to think about, whether you want to want a judge or a jury, and that decision will be made. At the end of the day, a, uh, a, 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 the decision by a judge can be appealed uh, so, and, and up, taken up to a higher court if you don't like the result. Um, so let's look at the pros and cons of these two of, of litigation. The pros of litigation, I mean, nobody wants to litigate, let's face it, but at least you know what the rules are. The rules are laid out in a statute that's no guessing what's allowable, what's not allowable. The procedure is laid out by statute. The rules are laid out. It keeps people on track. It, it, it prevents a bunch of foolishness usually happening if you've got a judge that's got a backbone. And you're going to get a definitive decision and usually a reasoned opinion. In other words, the judge will probably write an opinion saying, I find for ABC company and this is why. The evidence was this, the evidence was that. Uh, according to the case law, which is X, under these circumstances, I must rule for company B. And so you've got, you've got a ruling that you can rely upon. It's, 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 it's final as to that court, but if you have believe that the judge has made a clear error of law, just a misapplication of the law to the facts, then it, it, these cases can be appealed to a higher authority. They can go to the, if it's a state circuit court case, it can go to the state Supreme Court. If it, Maryland has an intermediate court, it has a court of special appeals and a court of appeals. Virginia goes from court, the circuit court to the Virginia Supreme Court if, it's, um, if, the, if the Virginia Supreme Court grants the writ of certiorari. And ultimately in the federal system, you could find your way all the way up to the, to this, the Supreme Court of the United States. And one, another good thing that's not on here about the pros is judges, as I said earlier, are known entities. There's something going on right down the street, as you may be aware of, involving a certain judge. And what these parties are going back and forth on are saying, well, he said in XYZ opinion that, that, that he ruled in favor of corporations. And he, so <laughs> the whole point of that is, is Judge Gorsuch has a record. And these legislators are arguing about how they think he would rule in the future. And that's one advantage you have when you have judges. They all have records that you can read their opinions. You know where they're going to go on certain issues. So that's an advantage. The cons of litigation are many. It's extremely stressful. It's lengthy. I mean, the, the cases have gotten a lot faster than they used to be, but an average case to go to trial is apparently 20, 25 months. Um, it, now, we do live in an area where, uh, it, particularly in Northern Virginia, it's known, the federal court, as many, many of you may know, is known as the rocket docket. It was the model nationwide, and that's the, that's the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia, is known as the rocket docket. A lot of people want their cases filed there. A lot of folks that have tech businesses and government contract businesses in Northern Virginia want their cases brought in the Eastern District because that is known as the rocket docket and they don't mess around. You file your case in January, you're going to trial in August or September and that's very unusual for federal courts and they don't care how complex it is. Um, believe me, some of my most painful moments have been standing in front of the judges of that court trying to get an extension for whatever reason and they say no way. So you've got to have a really good reason to get an extension. So, so, but, but as generally speaking, that's the exception, and, and litigation can be very lengthy. By the same token, I just finished a case in, for this firm that, that predated my arrival here by five years. This case took 10 years to wind its way through the federal system and went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. So it can be extremely lengthy, especially if you have a plaintiff or, or on the other side who's, who's willing to keep it going. Uh, this one, unfortunately, we had a lawyer who wasn't getting paid and was doing it as a favor, which was a nightmare because she didn't care how long it went. Litigation is extremely expensive, especially now in the digital age. Um, when I first started practicing, you would have a breach of contract case. You'd have the contract, you'd have a few letters back and forth, you'd have some telephone messages, and that'd be it. And, the, and you would have maybe three, four, five hundred documents, uh, pages of documents. Nowadays, everybody at your business is, is typing out 50, 60 emails a day. All of them could... Every one of those is a separate document. Every single one of them could touch on the subject matter of this case. You are gener your company is generating thousands of documents on a daily, if not weekly basis on these contracts. So when you have a contract case and you have discovery, I want all the communications related to X contract with the Navy. That could be 500,000 documents. So in the digital age, the discovery has gotten so expensive that I tell my clients routinely, you're going to spend fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars on discovery. 
based upon my review of this case, or you're going to spend $100,000 on discovery, or you're going to spend $20,000. But, but because of the electronic um, discovery now and the amount of documents that are generated, it's extraordinarily expensive to do discovery process. Another disadvantage of litigation, pleadings are public. Uh, I can sit in the courtroom and watch any trial I want unless it has to do with national security, and your, your, your guys up there testifying on the stand about and being cross-examined by some you know, ruthless advocate about the practices that he or she engaged in that are sketchy, <laughs> they can be sitting there from the Washington Post, they can be sitting there from any, anybody who wants to watch it can watch it, and the, the opinions are available online. All you've got to do is go on PACER and we'll go on the government. If you want to find out if one of your opponents has ever been sued before, just plug their name into one of these federal court systems and, as a defendant and see, what, see what's happened. So it's all public record. And again, it's appealable, which is a pro and a con. Appealable, in, in the instance that I said with the, with the case I was talking about, they kept it going for 10 years. Appealable if you're on the receiving end of a bad judgment is a good thing. If you're on the receiving end of a good judgment, appealable is a bad thing. So I I got to pick up the pace here. We're going to talk about some about mediation. And mediation is is a form of ADR that is generally voluntary. Um, you 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 can't usually hold a gun to a party and and say you've got to go mediate. You've got to go sit in a room with me and talk nicely about resolving this dispute. And and so that's um, now, now, sometimes mediation can be ordered by the judges. The judges say, well, I'm going to send you guys to mediation because I think this case ought to be mediated. And, and, and you have to go, but you don't have to resolve the dispute. You may be compelled to go, but you're never compelled to settle. Um, so in mediation, you have a third-party neutral who tries to get the parties to, to come together and reach an agreement. Uh, it's not an adversarial proceeding. It's a, it's, a, it's a process by which you try to negotiate a resolution. Um, you can select your own mediator, usually, unless you're in the federal court system. And one of the great things about filing a case in the federal court is that the federal court provides magistrate judges, which are federal judges. They're United States District Court judges, but they just handle different kinds of cases than the full-on judges do. And they will provide a magistrate judge to you at no expense. That's one of the great things about mediating in federal court. Or you can select your mediator and through either a company or through um, a service that provides them or from a mediation service and you can read their resumes and find somebody that specializes in GovCon or specializes in, in, in certain statutes. Um, as I said, the mediator doesn't make a decision. He or she tries to help the parties reach an agreement and it can be, you can walk out whenever you want to if it's not working. It can be non-binding or if at the end of the day you do reach an agreement, then you'll sign and fill out the terms of the agreement and sign it and you will have a contract that is enforceable. And, and as I said, you can abandon the process if it's not working out. One other thing, advantage of it is that the timing of the mediation is flexible. You can mediate before you file a suit. You can mediate a week before trial. You can mediate in the middle of a case. You can mediate when, mediate when no suit's being filed. So there, you're very flexible with regard to mediation. If the other side says, look, let's try to work this out, and the executives can't work it out, and you want a third party neutral to try to go back and forth, then mediation might be the right thing for you. Again, if you go to the next slide, um, there are different paths to mediation. It can be part of a contract. You might have a, a contract where you're the prime or the sub, and the con I've seen provisions where, well, if the parties enter into a dispute, the first thing they do is they'll carry it up to the executive level, and the executives will get on the phone and try to work it out. If that fails, then the parties will enter into mediation, maybe with X service, maybe no service, maybe nothing specified. If mediation fails, then the parties may resolve their dispute in by litigation in the courts of X, X county. Uh, so it can be part of a contract. It can be court ordered. Like I said, most federal judges, a lot of federal judges will order you into mediation. Some of them won't. Some of them will just strongly suggest it. Uh, some state courts have now have mandatory mediation programs because the courts have found, and the reason they do this is the courts have found and surveys show that 85 to 90 percent of cases that are brought Suits that are filed settle, and if 85 to 90 percent of cases are settling, then obviously the courts want to unclog the courts, so they are pushing litigating parties toward mediation. And, it, and I've seen that more and more as time has gone on, that, that state courts are writing into their procedures, you will go to mediation. And um, the other is simply by, as I mentioned earlier, by the parties may agree to try to, hey, let's try to mediate this thing before we spend you know, $500,000 on the lawyers. Um, so the process for mediation is uh, 
you, well, first of all, you select a mediator. As I said, if you're in federal court, the mediator will probably be selected for you, um, or, or the mediator source could be specified in your contract. It may say the parties will use, there's a group locally, popular group known as JAMS, J-A-M-S. The parties will select a mediator from JAMS. Or I've seen lots of government, contract, government contracting contracts that say the parties will mediate through the American Arbitration Association. That may sound strange because the American Arbitration Association is known as, arbit as an arbitrating group, but they have a mediation wing as well, and they have mediation rules. And some contracts specify that it will be AAA mediation. So how this is going to work is once you mediate, and, 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 and frankly, you know, I spend a lot of time when I talk to my clients about mediation, because I'm a big fan of mediation personally, and, and there's some groups, for example, like the McCammon group is one that I use a lot. And it's popular in Northern Virginia, D.C. and Maryland area, but there's groups like this all over the country. But they have a lot of retired judges, and they have a lot of highly experienced lawyers that have been there and done that. And you know what their practice area has been if they're lawyers, when they were lawyers, and you know that the judges have seen these kinds of disputes hundreds of times. And some of these judges, retired judges and, and lawyers, are extremely effective in bringing parties together. In any case, so you try to select a mediator that you believe has expertise in the subject matter of the dispute, obviously. In many of our cases, it would be someone with experience in government contracting, and you can find them. There are plenty of them. First thing that happens, you agree on the mediator. You call up the mediator or the service that provided the mediator, and they set a scheduling conference where you get on the phone with the, um, with the mediator and you set a conference. And what usually happens in these conferences is the judge, if it's a retired judge or the attorney, says, okay, well, let's, let's, let's pick a date. And so you pick a date. We're going to mediate on June 1st. Okay, so why don't you all get me, um, you, I understand this is a breach of contract. Why don't you all get me your papers on why you think, you know, your case is stronger. I want to know what the basis of the case is. I want to know why you believe that you're entitled to relief and, and, and what your settlement position might be. Now, you can either send that to the mediator as a confidential submission, which he or she will keep to himself or herself, or you can send a mediation statement that doesn't have your settlement position, but just lays out your best argument, and you share that with the other side. The point being that when you go into a mediation, the mediator that's sitting there has read the papers, he or she knows what the facts are, he or she presumably knows what law applies to those facts, and the more educated your mediator is, the better chance you have of getting an effective and, and, and satisfying resolution. And by the way, in my mind, a satisfying resolution of a mediation is when both parties walk out miserable. Because if one party is walking out of a mediation kicking their heels and saying, ha-ha, that's not, a, that's not an effective mediation. That's, that's a win. And I, I, when I say miserable, what I mean is relatively unhappy. Uh, both parties need to give and be prepared to give in a mediation, or it's not going to settle, and you may as well go litigate it or arbitrate it. Uh, the whole point of mediation being that the parties have to be willing to take their position and back off of it and, and reach a compromise, knowing that if they don't, then they're going to stroke a check to Palermo Maza or Sidley and Austin or whoever they've hired to do this litigation um, and it, for hundreds of thousands of dollars to, dis to, to, to resolve the dispute. And then you, So you submit the papers, then you have the session, and the way it usually works is that we'll all walk into one conference room. Now, I have to say, I did one a couple of weeks ago where I never saw uh, the other side because they were so hostile that the mediator decided that he didn't want to have a joint session. That's pretty unusual. Um, in, my, in my experience, what usually happens is everybody gets together in one room, and the judge or the, or the attorney says, gives the, the spiel about, I know what the facts are, I know about this dispute, I know Mr. Mengel, I know what your, your party's position is, uh, Mr. Jones, I know what your, or Ms. Jones, I know what your party's positions are, this is the way the mediation is going to work. I'm going to talk to you back in, uh, in this joint session, then I'm going to go back and forth. Um, I, I mean, I'm certainly old enough to remember this, many of you probably aren't, but you might remember the shuttle diplomacy that Henry Kissinger was doing when he was trying to resolve the Middle East crisis. It's basically, he was flying to Israel, you know, to Palestine or Israel to Egypt or wherever, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's what a mediator does. A mediator gets the parties together and then he separates the parties in the separate rooms and then starts back and forth, back and forth, trying to get to yes. Now this, you'll see on this slide that's optional opening statements. Um, I am personally generally an advocate for 
uh, not having opening statements in mediations, because the whole point of a mediation is to get the parties together. There is an underlying current and of, 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 of hostility. There is a dispute in the room. You, you, the parties don't agree. The last thing, I think, in my personal opinion, you need when you're trying to go to a mediation to get somebody to compromise is for me to stand up and wag my finger in, across the table in someone's face and saying, well, your client breached this contract, Mr. Jones, and that's why we should, we should get X. It just sets the wrong tone. I, I think that my general personal preference is to waive opening statements. The mediator knows what the, what the deal is. I know what the facts are. The other side knows what the facts are. A mediation, to me, is not the time or the place for an attorney to stand up and say how tough they are and, 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 and how much they know. And, and, and uh, so I personally usually waive opening statement, and I urge my clients to waive opening statement. Ultimately, of course, it's the client's decision. If the client wants to see me stand up and give an opening statement, I can. But I tend to try to be as conciliatory as possible in the open session and then take the gloves off in the private session and let the judge know what's going to happen if this thing goes to trial. Um, and so then, as I said, the, the mediator goes back and forth. You, have a, you probably have an exchange of settlement offers. You can, and, and one thing I like about mediation is you can say to the mediator, for example, now, now Ms. Jones, I can tell you right now that I, I've got, this is what's going to happen at trial, and I know that their, their guy's going to say X, or I've got this smoking gun document that I'm going to produce that I don't want them to know about right now, but, you, but I want you to hint to them to let them know that they've got a problem if this thing goes to trial. In other words, you can convey things to the mediator that they can go back and forth with and not and either disclose to the other side or not disclose to the other side. But if you tell them that you've got something that really you've got the goods on the other person, that may that may shade how they go in and talk to the other side about maybe resolving or backing off their position. If if it if it works out, I mean and usually mediator mediation, you usually know if you start at nine in the morning and you and the ball hasn't moved by three or four in the afternoon, a lot of mediators will just will just give up. But, but if there's progress being made, usually a good mediator will, will stick with it to the end, continue it to the next day, or re agree to reconvene if the parties can't stick around. Um, and then if you reach an agreement, then what usually happens is you draft a, a, a document that lays out all the terms, and you sign off on that, and that is usually an enforceable contract. Pros and cons. Pros of, of mediation is informal. You can relax. You can take your tie off. The, the, the point is to be comfortable. It's, it, it's confidential. Nothing that is said in the mediation can be used in litigation. You can, you can sit in front of the other side and say, yeah, okay, well, Joe Smith did leave the company, but, and none of that stuff is going to be, it's, you have to sign a confidentiality agreement before you go into mediation. So, so what, what happens in mediation, it's like Las Vegas, what happens in mediation stays in mediation. Um, obviously, you save money if it's resolved without litigating. It, can, it saves time. It's certainly more expeditious than litigation. And as I said earlier, you can interpose it at any time prior to the litigation or going to trial. You avoid stress. Litigation is extremely stressful. So is arbitration. And, and you avoid your time away from work and your, and your employee's time away from work and the delay. Litigation takes time. The, the, the mediator can come up with some sort of creative resolution that you might not get from a judge. Um, and, and again, I've mentioned the federal courts provide mediators at, at no expense to the parties. So downside, if you go through all of that, and it is, it's, not, it's not inexpensive, but it's certainly a lot less expensive than litigation because you don't have discovery, but you do have to have the attorneys there, you have to draft the statements. But if you go on to that process and you don't get a resolution, then you're going to still have to go arbitrate or litigate. And it can be fairly expensive. Some of these mediators have fairly high hourly rates. But I personally am a big fan, and I can tell you right now from personal experience, in the last six months, I've had mediations, one in West Palm Beach in Florida, and one here in um, D.C., that I gave zero chance of settling. The parties were so far apart. In fact, the one I went to in Florida, even the plaintiff said, this is a monumental waste of time. There's no way we're going to settle. We had 15 different parties, and that federal judge got those parties to an agreement, and I couldn't believe it. So you, you'd be surprised, even if you think you're completely dug in, a good mediator can bring your conflict uh, to a satisfactory resolution. Um, some of the considerations, if, if some party is dug in and you don't think there's any way they're going to possibly settle or they've told you your client's not going to settle, it's not the right case for mediation, but you'd be surprised. If the parties are going to have an ongoing relationship and they're going to have to be working together for years, you might not want to go to litigation and arbitration because somebody's going to come out, you know, uh, on the losing end of that, and you might want to not have an aggressive 
a litigation process with a, with a party with whom you have an ongoing relationship. And the third one is whether you have enough information to even resolve the dispute. A lot of times with, with for example, you have to have some discovery to find out what really went on. You think you might know what went on and you bring a lawsuit. You may have to get some discovery before you can go straight to mediation because you really don't have enough information to, to, to resolve the case. You don't want to uh, buy a pig in the poke and settle a case just because you've been sued. Uh, it doesn't mean you want to settle a case without having some information from the other side. So all those go into uh, factoring in your decision as to whether or not you want to mediate. And I need to turn it over to Ambi now because I'm just about at the end of my time. All right. Thank you, Paul. So we're going to turn now to arbitration, the third way to resolve a dispute. So we've gone through litigation and mediation. Um, with regards to arbitration, the first point is that there are third-party neutrals who resolve the dispute between the parties. So this is uh, sounds somewhat similar to mediation in, in that it involves third-party neutral. Um, but the difference is where in mediation, the neutral party is helping the parties come together, compromise, and reach an uh, agreement. In arbitration, the third party neutral is actually going to be responsible for resolving the dispute. Um, you can have a single arbitrator or you can have um, more than one. You typically see maybe one arbitrator in a smaller case and up to three in larger cases. Um, the second bullet point is the arbitrator's decision is binding. So the arbitrator, arbitrator is going to be looking at the issues of law and fact that the parties present and is going to reach a binding decision. Uh, the actual decision reached by the arbitrators are, is appealable only in very limited circumstances, uh, which we'll go into um, in a couple of slides. So in terms of the paths to arbitration, um, there's two different ways that you can end up in arbitration. One is contractual, and the other one is the agreement of the conflicting parties. Um, with reference to the contractual path, uh, so this is when parties have entered into a contract. They have the disputes resolution clause that calls for arbitration in the event of a dispute between the parties. Uh, there is a Federal Arbitration Act, and then there are similar uh, state acts um, which are under the Uniform Arbitration Act. And those acts say that when you have an agreement to arbitrate that's in a contract between the parties, those uh, agreements to arbitrate are valid, irrevocable, and enforceable. So um, usually if you have that in the contract, the parties are going to end up arbitrating. Um, you, there, it, as long as one of the parties still wants to arbitrate, um, that they can go into court and they can have that be enforceable. Um, you will see sometimes where there may be an arbitration provision in a, in a contract and neither one of the parties wants to arbitrate and it could end up in, in litigation or mediation. But as long as one of the parties wants to arbitrate and you have that provision in your contract, you're going to end up in arbitration. Um, the next little bullet point that I have, uh, which is just the federal statute from um, on the Federal Arbitration Act, 9 U.S.C. Section 3, sometimes you'll see a party will rush into court um, and they, they want to litigate um, and so they'll bring a they'll bring a litigation, they'll initiate, initiate litigation and then the other party will say, whoa, 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 this contract has an arbitration clause in it and the party should actually be in arbitration. Um, and in those instances, the courts will just stay the litigation and then will send the case to arbitration. And Amy, if I could add, and I'm amazed at how many how many cases I've seen where people have just totally disregarded arbitration provisions and gone and filed a suit, right. and the first thing the defending party walks is and says the judge does an arbitration provision, and a hundred times out of a hundred, the judge will enforce the arbitration provision. Absolutely, yeah. A lot of times people will just overlook that provision altogether, or they, um, they, or hope, they, or they hope that the other party will overlook it, and um, they'll, they'll just rush into court, and then they'll end up back in arbitration. Um, sometimes you'll have instances where a party will just refuse to arbitrate altogether. You'll it, initiate the arbitration proceedings and they just won't be responding or they um, are just outright refusing to, to arbitrate um, and a court can force that party to arbitrate. It can order them to arbitrate. And then the, um, the other path to arbitration is the agreement of the conflicting parties. And that's when, um, you know, the dispute has arisen. There's nothing that's in the contract dispute resolution provision that says that the parties are going to arbitrate, but they mutually come to a decision that that's what they want to do to resolve the dispute. And so you can enter arbitration that way. 
All right, turning to the actual process for arbitration. So the first thing is the initiation of the arbitration. Um, that usually will be, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, there'll be a demand for arbitration. Um, and then usually that's very simple, um, not very complicated document. It's not as detailed normally as a complaint that you'll see in litigation. It'll usually say, you know, this is a arbitration based on breach of contract. It will have um, a short description of what the, what the breach is, and then it'll have a copy of the uh, contract disputes resolution clause saying that this could go into arbitration, and, and then the um, filing fee. And then just as in litigation where the respondent or, or the litigant and uh, defendant in litigation has a certain amount of time to file an answer, in this case the uh, respondent, that's what the defendant's called in arbitration, the respondent has a certain number of days where they will file a response to the demand for arbitration. And, and Amy, with regard to the, those submissions, they're, they're now basically uniform because if you go to the AAA, for example, they, the form you're going to submit is electronic. And it really doesn't give you the opportunity right. to say it's, very it's, much. It's a fill in it's a fill in the blank sort of form. So it really is a it's a very simple process to at least get arbitration um, initiated. Um, the next step in the process will be the selection of the arbitrators. Uh, that is a process where you can initially tell the whatever the arbitration services that you're using. Paul mentioned JAMS and the Cameron Group and the American Arbitration Association. Um, you can tell them what sort of qualifications you're seeking in an arbitrator um, or a panel of arbitrators if that's what you, if it's a larger dispute. So, you know, you could say you're looking for someone who has a lot of employment law experience or government contract experience, whatever it is that you think is uh, required to resolve your dispute. And then the uh, forum usually will provide a list of arbitrators um, along with their bio biographies, and you can select among those individuals as to who you think will be the best um, arbitrator for your case. The parties can either then mutually agree to a, an arbitrator, which I haven't really seen happen. There usually is some disagreement. Um, what you see more often is the parties will rank the arbitrators in order of preference, and then whatever the arbitration service you're using, uh, they, will, they will look at both parties' rankings and then decide who will be the best arbitrator for that dispute. Uh, the next uh, step in the pros process is the scheduling conference, and it's also sometimes called a preliminary hearing, it's similar to what Paul was discussing with the mediation process where you're setting up, and also in litigation, the um, scheduling order, where you're setting up what the next steps are going to be in the process. Uh, you'll figure out the exchange of documents, um, when you're going to be exchanging documents, whether you're going to be doing pre-hearing briefs, when those will be due, what the date and location of the hearing will be if that hasn't already been specified in the um, disputes resolution clause in the contract, the due dates for witness list and for exhibits, um, things of that matter. Then you'll get into the discovery process. Um, that is the process that usually is the most time consuming and most expensive um, in litigation and it can be in arbitration as well. But one of the things about arbitration is that you can, the parties can agree to a more limited discovery process. Um, they can, I've seen some arbitration provisions that will say that there's not going to be any disco discovery at all. And I've actually been involved in a case where there was no discovery. The parties just had what they each had in their individual capacities and they weren't exchanging any sort of um, evidence back and forth before the actual arbitration hearing. It, but it's fair to say, Amy, isn't it, that, that unlike in litigation where every state has its own discovery rules and, allow, and how much you can have and are allowed to have, right. and every federal court does, there are usually no provisions in any arbitration rules that simply says it's up to the arbitrator whether or not and to allow the scope of the discovery. Right. Arbitrators, the arbitrators, arbitrators, you can take one deposition and you can right. have five interrogatories or something like right. that. Right. Yeah, the, the arbitrator has the discretion to decide how much discovery there is going to be. I mean, that's usually done in, with conjunc in conjunction with the parties. They'll discuss discuss it at the scheduling um, hearing or scheduling conference, but um, the, the arbitrator definitely has discretion as to whether there will be discovery allowed and the scope of the discovery. I think it's fair to say, though, it's always more limited than it is it's in a, Yeah, it always is more limited. The um, arbitrators also, they do have the power to summon witnesses to attend the arbitration hearing and to bring relevant documents to the hearing. That's a power that they have under the Federal Arbitration Act. So um, even though you're not in actual uh, court, there still is some ability to have witnesses be compelled to attend that arbitration. 
Um, the next step would be the actual submission of briefs prior to the arbitration hearing. This is when you're going to be, each party is going to be setting out their positions. Um, and those, those briefs are usually exchanged before the hearing. Um, and you can, you're setting out your legal position as well as the factual uh, arguments of the parties. So you're going to be attaching the relevant exhibits to that uh, position paper. Then you'll have the actual arbitration hearing. Uh, this is where you, the parties are physically uh, present with the arbitrator or arbitra arbitrators. Um, the parties are going to be giving opening statements. Uh, Paul had mentioned before how in mediation he finds it not to be helpful to have opening statements. But I think in arbitration, I mean, you usually are going to have the opening statements. This is more adversarial um, and more similar to litigation than mediation is. So each party is going to want to get up in front and, um, you know, state what their position is. The arbitrator obviously also has discretion. They could say, I've read your papers and we don't need an opening statement. But typically you'll see opening statements. Um, then comes the presentation of evidence. This is the part of the hearing that's, that's mostly the most similar to an actual trial. You're going to have the examination of the witnesses as well as the cross-examination of the witnesses by the attorneys. Um, there could be evidentiary matters that come up, whether certain evidence should be considered admissible or whether the arbitrator is going to consider certain evidence, um, and they, they'll rule on those matters. Uh, it's definitely not as formal a process of a, as a uh, litigation proceeding. You're not going to be in court. You're usually going to be in a conference room. It could be either at a law firm or it could be at one of the arbitration services, uh, physical locations. So it's not it's not as formal, but you are going to go through. Um, there there are similarities to litigation, and then the last step was going to be the closing statements, um, where it's similar to the um, you know, opening statements. The opening statements lay out, this is what we're going to be presenting. The closing statements lay out, this is what we have presented. Um, and then after the arbitration hearing is over, and, and the arbitration hearing can last anywhere from like half a day to a couple of weeks, um, just depending on how complex the case is. After the arbitration hearing is over, the uh, parties usually will submit briefs uh, to the arbitrator. And you know, sometimes this will just be summarizing, uh, reiterating, and making your strongest points from what actually happened at the arbitration hearing. You're going to be citing to the actual transcripts from the testimony of the witnesses. Um, other times I've seen where the arbitrators will have specific questions that were uh, that came up during the arbitration hearing. They could be legal questions that they want the attorneys to address, or they could be factual uh, questions that the parties need to address, and those should be incorporated into the um, into the submission, uh, into the briefs that are submitted after the hearing. And then there's the, um, the actual arbitral decision. This is one of the things that I'd say is a, a pro um, in the arbitration uh, process. It, those decisions are typically going to be much quicker than the decision that you would get in court. Um, I know that under the uh, American arbitration rules and the JAMS rules, they usually want the arbitrator to make a decision within 30 days after um, either the end of the arbitration hearing or the submission of the briefs after the arbitration hearing. Whereas in uh, you know, state or federal court, there really is no timeline for when a, a judge has to issue a decision. Um, I think one of the things that holds that up, if I may, Amy, is mm -hmm. whether or not you've agreed in advance to just a decision or what they call a reasoned, right. reasoned decision where the arbitrator will actually write a, right a little out, miniature right, opinion, right. like a legal opinion. Right. Yeah. You can get a ruling where the arbitrator just says, you know, I decide that ABC company is going to be awarded $30,000, and that's the end of the decision. And there's really no um, more detailed reasoning to it. You don't know why they have issued that decision. Um, and, or you can ask for a reasoned decision where they're going to have to, um, mm -hmm, where they're going to have to um, explain their reasoning. Uh, go through these. We're running a little bit short on time, so I'll try and go through these other ones quickly. Uh, the pros of arbitration. We have confidential. So in terms of confidential, the proceedings are held in private. This is different than litigation where you're going into an open court room where anyone could come in. Um, you're going to be in a, you know, a private conference room and in addition the parties can agree that, that everything is going to be confidential, that they're not going to be speaking about the contents of what was discussed during the arbitration um, outside or publicly and 
so that that's you know one of the one of the pros. Uh, there's the potential to save time. The uh, under the American arbitration rules, the median length of time from filing a arbitration to the final award was um, 297 days, so about 10 months. And that's for cases that were between 750,000 to 500,000. 500, uh, there were you know, varying time lengths depending on how, the size of the case. The smaller cases typically were quicker and longer cases took longer. And then there's the availability for expedited um, proceedings. For certain cases that are under a certain dollar amount, the um, arbitration service may allow for the procedures to be expedited. You have a quicker process. Timelines will be quicker um, for getting in evidence, for, su for submitting your briefs, and for a decision. Uh, there's the potential to save money. There are, are sliding fee schedules, which um, are based on how far in the case the parties proceed. There also is limited discovery. Um, you know, as we said, that the arbitrator has discretion as to how much discovery is allowed. There is the ability to select arbitrators with a background in the specific subject matter that you're uh, focusing on, that your matter is about. Uh, the decisions are is issued soon after the hearing, and then there's relaxed evidentiary rules. While the, um, the arbitrator can say we're not letting certain certain evidence in. Um, and, and they can make evidentiary rulings. It just it's a less formal process. The cons are it can be um, costly. You do need to pay an administrative fee to the actual arbitration service, uh, the company that's providing the service. In addition, the arbitrator's fees, they have hourly fees and they have travel expenses, whereas with a judge, you're not paying for their, their fees. Obviously, if you go into court with an arbitrator, um, you know, they're going to have to spend time reviewing your briefs, preparing for the hearing, um, reviewing, reviewing your post-hearing briefs, and uh, you're going to pay hourly for each one of those things. And then if they have to travel to the hearing, um, you're going to be paying for that as well. The um, enforcing an arbitration award can be an extra step. Um, most of the time, I think it's about 90% of the time, the the, the party that hasn't won will voluntarily comply with whatever the arbitral award was. But um, if the party doesn't apply, then the, uh, the other party that did win can go into court and have the arbitration award uh, confirmed. And so that's an extra step that, that may have to happen. Um, limited discovery, while that can be a benefit because it's less expensive, it also can be um, a con because if you need that discovery in order to, to prove your case, uh, that can be problematic. The ability to file dispositive motions is not a matter of right, which is, so say you have a motion for summary judgment where, you know, you don't feel like you need to go further into the process. Um, that's not something that you can act, you can absolutely have the right to do, whereas in court you would have um, a, the ability to do that. And then there's a very limited right to, to vacate, modify, or correct an award. Um, you have to have, if you're going to vacate an arbitration award, it has to have been procured by corruption, fraud, or undue means or the arbitrator has to be um, partial or, or corrupt. Um, there is a manifest dis disregard of the law standard, but um, that the uh, Supreme Court recently said in 2008 that the exclusive grounds for, um, for vacating an award are the ones that I just listed, you know, corruption, fraud, undue means. So there currently is a circuit split over whether that still is viable. Um, so generally speaking, if you if the if the arbitrator just got the law wrong, that's probably not going to be enough to um, to have the uh, award no, overturned. I, I think it's less than probably. I, I mean, it's, we've had arbitrations <laughs> where the judge has been dead wrong on the law, and the the courts will not go back and revisit it. It's 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 a significant risk of it, arbitration. It's definitely a risk. It does also matter what circuit you're on, but it's definitely a risk, or what circuit or state you're in, but it's certainly a risk. And then the last con is that there's no jury trial, which depending on the case you may want. Um, and then considerations of determining whether your case is suitable for arbitration. Um, if it is a specialized area of knowledge or industry, um, you may want to be able to pick who is going to be deciding the case instead of just being selected a judge or given a judge, uh, whether you have sufficient information to resolve the dispute or whether you're going to need more discovery, and then also whether you believe that you have a viable dispositive motion, um, which you would be able to file in court but may not have the opportunity to file in arbitration. 
Um, this is just a list of the um, arbitration services that we mentioned, the American Arbitration Association, the Kamen Group, and JAMS. They provide both mediation and arbitration services. And then these are the types of mediators or arbitrators that you'll see. Paul mentioned uh, these before. You can have uh, former retired judges uh, practicing or retired law firm attorneys. And then you can just have industry experts or business leaders um, who you may feel are better um, situated to handle your dispute. Yeah, the, the one you pick may be driven by the facts of the case. You might want someone that's, that, had, that, that was in a construction case. You might want someone from the construction industry as opposed to a judge. Right. But I think Ambie's, that's an excellent presentation, Ambie. And I think that, yeah, I, in my experience, I've found that a lot of government contractors have a default provision in their contracts, which is arbitration. And I, as I have practiced over the years, I think that the, the general consensus or the, the sort of common thought out there was, well, you know, I don't want to go to court. I'm going to arbitrate. Well, you need to think long and hard about that because some arbitrators will allow a lot of discovery, so you end up doing just as much discovery as you would almost in litigation. Um, the, the decision is finally, you can't take that arbitrator decision to a judge and say, that guy's crazy. I mean, he's dead wrong, judge. You've got to reverse that opinion. You're stuck with it. And, and so it's a real consideration. You should think long and hard before you automatically put an arbitration provision in your contract and think about the ramifications of it. And I have over the years, I'm afraid to say, come more towards the litigation because I like the having a judge that's informed. I like, uh, I like being able to appeal the decision if it's wrong. So I think it's just something you need to consider. Don't assume that arbitration is going to be expedient or less expensive or going to get you the result that you want. But obviously we have a lot of subject area. We're about out of time. I'm going to try to get to some questions if I can really quickly. Uh, and I know that some of you out there, based on the questions, have uh, experience with arbitration based upon the questioners. Uh, and so I'm going to try to get to these. One question is, um, when does the location specified in the subcontract get overruled? It's pretty rare, actually. Courts, in my experience, will defer to venue decisions unless, I think one of the only standards that the courts will look at to, to flip the, the, the decision that was made, because courts will say, well, these parties agreed to this. this they bargained for this. They, they arm's length negotiated this, this location. I'm not going to overturn it unless there's no reasonable uh, connection to the venue. In other words, I'm in North Carolina and you're in Virginia and we're going to arbitrate in Alaska. Now, the judge may, if the inconvenience of the parties is such that you can convey, can compel the arbitrator to change it, or the board, but, but generally speaking, you know, courts will defer to arbitration, uh, to, to location decisions. How do you direct what state laws will be considered in ADR? Um, that is usually, should be specified in, a, in an arbitration provision or in a contract. You should specify, because frankly, certain, like for example, in employment law cases, you may want to have a provision in your employment agreement or your contract that says that the law of Maryland is going to apply because the law of Maryland, they'll blue pencil agreements. And if you, if you find that one provision of your employment agreement is unenforceable, the courts will just strike it and they'll try to make the, the provision enforceable. Whereas in Virginia, if, if the provision that, that the offending provision is unenforceable, the agreement's unenforceable. But usually uh, the state law is decided by a provision in the contract that specifies it or if you just, you may defer to traditional notions of contract law. Where was the contract executed? Where was the contract to be performed? If it's a tort, or where was the contract breached? If it's a tortious interference or a defamation, where did the defamation occur? Or where did the damage occur? So there are traditional uh, legal analyses that you apply based on the facts if it's not specified. And each state has its own, has its own contract law and tort law as to decide it, sometimes it's where the last act occurred in executing the contract. It goes back and forth around the country, and the last person signed it in D.C., it may be D.C., so it depends on the, the facts. Uh, can that be changed if the other side of the project is in their backyard and not state specified? Again, you can always reach an agreement, but you can also, uh, I mean, in, it's, it, it's, it's, it's fact-specific analysis. One says, will you be discussing non-binding arbitration? I, I, don't, I don't mean to be disrespectful here, but non-binding arbitration is really mediation. I mean, an arbitration... It, there, an arbitrator is going to reach a decision. A, a, a judge is going to reach a decision. Arbitrators don't usually bring people together to arbitrate, render a decision, and say, okay, well, you don't have to enforce it. So I think non-binding arbitration is kind of an oxymoron. That's more, more like mediation. And, and that, that process by which you get together with two parties that have a difference of opinion, and you get a third party to try to reach agreement, and that third party may indicate which way he or she would rule if she were a judge or he were a judge, 
but that's not binding on the parties. So sometimes you can get a mediator to indicate where they might go if the thing went to litigation and they were, they had their judge hat on instead of their mediator hat. Another question says, when you get around to the, uh, once you have an arbitrated settlement, as Ambie mentioned, or court judgment, how do you collect? Well, you you either take it to a collection lawyer who buy these, who 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 take these judgments and for a percentage, will collect it for you, or or you do it your your lawyer does it. And if your lawyer is going to do it, usually arbitration provisions have provisions that say this is enforceable in the courts of X. You take that judgment, you take it to the court, you file it with the court. That if if the company has bank assets there, you can garnish bank accounts, you can attach their property, but there each state has different collection laws. But it, it's I know it's very frustrating to collect because because people companies can be clever and they can hide their assets and, and you may have you know you may have to get in line with with uh, other creditors. So it can sometimes be difficult to collect but but aggressive collection uh, firms and lawyers that know how to collect can usually, I mean, we're in the process of collecting a, a, a decision right now by garnishing this company's bank accounts. You take the judgment to the court, they issue a garnishment, they send the garnishment to the bank, and you start yeah. getting their, their money. So there are ways to do it, but I understand from the, the questioner that it can be a very frustrating process, and a lot of times, I have to tell you, a lot of people end up with judgments after spending tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they can frame them and put them on the wall, but the, but the company doesn't have the assets. And that's something that we should have touched on. You need to think when you go into one of these processes, at the end of the day, is this a viable company? Is this a viable individual? Am I going to just have a judgment that's going to make the lawyers rich? Not that we are rich. Not that we would get rich. <laughs> um, but, but, but that, um, you know, what, I'm, what I mean is you're either going to pay the lawyers all this money. Am I going to have anything at the end of the day that's worth getting? And that may be something that leads you more towards the mediation or the, non, uh, the, non -con the uh, adversarial process. So... I'm afraid I've gone over, not surprisingly for any of you that know me, I went over. This is a, a very broad subject, and I would welcome any other questions. If you all want to shoot us an email about this, this process or about, advers, uh, about uh, ADR or about litigation, I'd be happy to answer your questions. You have our contact. And you should get a follow-up email in the next 24 hours with a copy of the slides and a link to this recorded session, and just pe feel free to share them. Again, sorry for going over. There's a lot of subject matter here that we tried to at least touch on. We hope you found it worthwhile, and uh, have a great day, and we, and we may look forward to the possibility of working with you in the future. Thank you.